Okay, so hello everyone. My name's Holly Wickens. I'm the International Officer for the Young Fabians. And tonight I'm really pleased to say that we are joined by the Chief Minister of Gibraltar, Fabian Picardo, and the Chair of the Youth Section for the GSLP, the Gibraltar Socialist Labour Party. So tonight we're going to basically kind of teach you about Gibraltar. I know I had to do a lot of research for this. We're going to talk about the history, the politics, the Socialist Labour Party over there, which is ever so slightly more successful than ours, and kind of what's going on today in Gibraltar. So to start off, um, Fabian and Nadia, Aidan, could you please just explain, so Gibraltar's what's called a British Overseas Territory. What does that even mean, and how did Gibraltar, which is not exactly close to Britain, become a British Overseas Territory in the first place? Okay, so let me let me take that one first. I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to be um, as techy as I'm able to and share this link. I don't know whether I'm going to be successful or not. Um, but I'm trying to do that now um, and tell you that Gibraltar first became British in 1704, um, and in that day, in those days, um, it was as a result of conquest. Um, and that conquest led to Gibraltar um, being uh, initially a colony. It was ceded by Spain after the initial conquest um, in the Treaty of Utrecht of 1713. And the first incarnation of Gibraltar <laughs> was a British colony uh, with the Gibraltar Supreme Court established and the jurisdiction of the governor and the chief justice of Gibraltar in the 19th century, eventually turning to the 20th century when you know, the United Kingdom went through the process of no longer being an imperial power um, and all of those uh, uh, statutes of Westminster, etc., before the, the war and then the process of decolonization after the Second World War, which was commenced by the United Nations. The, the UK established the United Nations Fourth Committee and the Committee of 24 on Decolonization. And subsequently, when the UK was left with a small number of territories, it re-denominated them, uh, us rather, as overseas territories rather than colonies. So the UK now has, I think, 16 overseas territories, the former colonies, um, and uh, two or three, I forget the, the exact number. I think the, the Isle of Man is also referred to as a crown dependency. So, uh, less overseas because they're in the area around the island of the United Kingdom. The interesting thing is that the overseas territories are not known as overseas territories everywhere in the world. At the United Nations in New York, those territories are on a list, the list of non-self-governing territories, <laughs> which in the lexicon of the United Nations are still referred to as colonial territories with colonial people and with the United Kingdom referred to as an administrative power in the same way as it was referred to in the 1950s and 60s when the work of that committee commenced. Great, thank you. And so you are now, Trevian, you're the Chief Minister of Gibraltar. So what does that actually mean in practice? What are the powers that you now have? So the, the Chief Minister of Gibraltar um, holds executive power in Gibraltar um, on the basis of the 2006 Constitution. And the, the interesting thing about the 2006 Constitution is that it reversed the position that had been under the 1969 Constitution, which was the earlier incarnation. Under the 1969 Constitution, the uh, Chief Minister and the Government of Gibraltar, which was a, a government of eight and an opposition of seven, the Government of eight held executive power for the things which were defined as being in their control. So therefore, the government of Gibraltar had executive control of defined domestic matters. The 2006 constitution turned out on its head um, and it gave the government of Gibraltar all the executive control of Gibraltar, except for those things that were retained by the United Kingdom in the figure of either the governor or the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs or the Secretary of State for Defence. And, and therefore, Gibraltar, Gibraltar's government has full executive power in respect of all matters in relation to Gibraltar, except matters relating to defense and national security, and matters relating to external uh, relations, except that there is a key nuance, 
Section 47.3 of the Constitution says that matters which are EU matters, and are therefore external, de facto, are not de jure external relations matters when they deal with matters which are in the competence of the portfolios of ministers of the government of Gibraltar. So matters which are European environmental matters, yes, they're external in the sense that they relate to that club to which we have all belonged de jure and now still remain in de facto, but they were still matters which were dealt with by ministers in Gibraltar. So um, very, very full powers in respect of all matters, very full autonomy in respect of all matters, except those specifically retained. Um, and those that are specifically retained, you can see, are in the nature of the type of things which are in the royal prerogative. Uh, and there is a strong argument that even those powers are exercised only in consultation with the government of Gibraltar and the chief minister of Gibraltar, who represents the elected will of the people of Gibraltar. Right. And so you refer to the elected will of the people of Gibraltar. So that leads me on to my next question. Gibraltar is obviously quite a small population of about 30,000. There are UK constituencies that are bigger than that. So I guess my next question is, Aidan especially, um, how do elections work in Gibraltar? How do you use first past the post? Do you elect constituency MPs? How do you go about electing your government? You're on mute, Aiden. <laughs> yeah, um, it works um, in, a, in a very a similar, similar manner as, as the UK. Um, Gibraltar, for example, as, as you stated, um, it's, a, it's a single constituency. And um, essentially, the way that it works is uh, on the day uh, of election, you have to go to um, the ballots and you uh, vote for uh, 10, um, 10 candidates. Um, it doesn't have to be from, from the same party like in, in other places in Europe you vote for the party rather than the individual. Here, no, here you vote for 10 individuals. Obviously, each party goes out canvassing and if they do have a, a party of 10, they will ask you to vote for all 10 candidates um, to ensure that they, that they become the, the governing party or to uh, enhance their prospects of becoming the government party. Um, but the electorate can, can choose each candidate as they wish. So they may decide to elect all from one party or some people tend to, tend to cross, uh, cross votes, but it's essentially down to the candidate. So when you go to a, an election, it's important that you, that you canvass uh, as a party, as a collective, but you also have to come out and show your individual persona and tell the people why you should be one of the people that they vote for both to encourage the people from your own party to vote for you and other people who may vote across the board or for personalities, as, as some call it, um, give you their vote as well. Cool. And so you two are both part of the Gibraltar Socialist Labour Party, right? The GSLP. You're currently in government, one of the few in Europe. Um, do you want to explain a bit about the origins of the party itself, kind of where did the party come from? I think you're the oldest surviving party in Gibraltar, I read online, or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah um, the, the GSLP essentially uh, started um, out of, out of uh, the trade union uh, movement uh, initially, um, and um, it, in its inception it, wasn't, it didn't start off as a GSLP because um, Essentially, there were members who were both from mixed from the left and the right wing. When the sort of right wing is left, it was established as a Gibraltar Socialist Labour Party. And it was founded by um, Sergio Bosano, who is now knighted, and he's still, very fortunately for us, still in Parliament. He's the oldest uh, current uh, elected member in Parliament. Um, and it came out from the, from the trade uh, union movement. And it was a, a sort of revolution because the, the party that had been there before, the uh, uh, advancement to the, uh, for civil rights, the ACR. Um, that was a party that was long-standing. They were uh, the party who worked on the repatriation of uh, the evacuees, the Gibraltarian evacuees uh, from the, the Second World War, coming back to uh, bringing them back to Gibraltar. Um, you know, and, and they were quite like a heavyweight party. Um, however, it was quite a, a revolution because when the JSLP first uh, came into government in 1988, it was the first time we actually had uh, working class individuals actually leading, leading the country. And as a result of that, uh, many socialist uh, reforms came about um, after, after their, their election in 1988, winning the first election. 
And Fabio, I know now you're in coalition, or I guess you two, you and another party kind of work together as a coalition with the Liberal Party. Do you want to explain a bit about how that works in practice and how that came about? So we, we have a very positive relationship with the Liberal Party. We started to work together in the late 90s. Um, that, that work was work done before elections. In other words, we were not thrown together by the results of an election that required us to um, reach terms in order to form a government. The process of working together started in opposition and we started to fight general elections together after we had fought a by-election together for the election of the then leader of the Liberal Party, Joseph uh, Garcia, who remains the leader of the Liberal Party, um, in a by-election in, uh, I believe, 1999, um, after the uh, unfortunate uh, passing of Aidan's grandfather, um, who was a member of the a party in the parliament, um, there was a, a by-election required, um, and uh, Joseph Garcia and Joe Bassano came to terms with each other that uh, the GSLP would support uh, Joseph's candidature, um, and if elected, then we would sit together in the House, in, our, in the House of Assembly. Um, and that's how the, the process started. And since then, the two uh, party executives have been uh, fighting general elections together. The two parties have a different structure, they have a different membership, uh, but we uh, reach an, an agreement on a joint manifesto and we fight elections on the basis of a GSLP liberal manifesto um, and it's been extraordinarily successful. We have been now uh, able to win uh, three elections, 2011, 2015 and 2019. Um, and indeed, since we got together, uh, no other party was able to break into opposition or to fend off uh, some other parties trying to come into opposition, but the, the GSLP Liberal Alliance was strong enough that although we had the Social Democratic Party on the other side in government um, in the elections which we lost, we had uh, you know, competitors trying to get into parliament and then oust us, that never happened. The GSLP and the Liberals fighting elections together had never polled less than 40% of the vote. Um, and the structure is such that we present for the 10 seats that we can aspire to. We present uh, seven socialist candidates and three liberal candidates. That's the split that has been agreed since uh, 1999 and 2000. Um, and it's worked extremely well. Having won the 2019 election, we have won five general elections, having won in 88 uh, and 92. That means that the Socialist Party in Gibraltar has won five of the last uh, general elections from counting from 1969. No other party has ever won five. Um, other parties have won four, and in fact, they've won four on the trot on two occasions against uh, us and others. Um, but nobody has ever won five. So we are, we are ahead on points. I'm very proud of that. I've led the party to three of those election victories. Joe's led us to two um, and to maintaining our hegemony of the seats on the opposition when we're not in government. So it's a track record that I think we can be proud of as socialists on the southernmost tip of the Iberian Peninsula. Absolutely. And I think it's a record that not many of the socialist parties in Europe have been able to have. The past decade has seen lots of socialist parties declining across Europe. And yet you, as you say, have managed to win three in a row. So how do you think, this is a question for both of you, how do you think you've managed to pull that off really? Um, do you think your alliance has been able to play a good part in that? Well, I think the, the alliance has been a hugely important part of that, in particular because in 2011, uh, Gibraltar was facing a party that had been in government for four terms. Um, it had become stayed. Um, there were issues as to style of government. Um, and there were serious issues also as to whether Gibraltar was progressive enough in 2011. And uh, you know, we were very energetic. We really wanted to come back um, into power in order to be able to do the things that we could see Gibraltar needed. Gibraltar needed new ideas, and we were ready with those new ideas, and those progressive ideas that we brought to the table uh, managed to excite enough people in Gibraltar that we won by 200 votes. I mean, this is a, 
and at that stage, you know, the numbers of, uh, of those elected were very tight. There were some candidates from one party on top of candidates from another party. Usually in Gibraltar, the top 10 represent the party that is in government and the next seven, the opposition split. Here, we were really enmeshed one with the other. Uh, but we managed to excite people with the very positive policies that we put in our first manifesto, which was called New Dawn. It was the, the longest uh, and the largest manifesto ever put to the people of Gibraltar. It was a very detailed manifesto. Um, and so our first manifesto really showed people that it was time to make a real change in Gibraltar and the way that Gibraltar was governed. Our second manifesto played on what we had achieved in our first term, and it was called Strongest Foundations. We talked about building Gibraltar on strong foundations, the ones we had laid in the first four years. In that election, we managed to take 68% of the vote, 68% of the vote. And our nearest rival, the, the GSD, the Social Democrats, took 32% of the vote. Yeah. In the following election, the one in 2019, our manifesto was called uh, Green Gibraltar, the child-friendly city. Um, and it also demonstrated that we were in tune with people's ideas. Then we took 52% of the vote, but our nearest rival took 25%, so less than the GSD had taken last time. And the opposition was then split. Um, and I'm very proud of, of that record and how we managed to show people the things that we wanted to do in great detail. I mean, our last manifesto was 140 pages long for a nation two and a half square miles by one mile at its widest point. That's a hell of a lot of detail about what we're going to do, uh, which we're happy to be held to. Although, of course, COVID uh, has been you know, yeah. us off course for a few months and it's going to be difficult uh, to get back into doing everything that's going to happen in that manifesto, but we're, we're proud of what we've achieved already. Brilliant. Um, and before I get on to you, Aidan, sorry, I've just reminded I need to say to everyone watching, we do a function. So what I will do is if you submit questions as we go along, at the very end, we're going to have a QA and a section and we will come to them. So use that function. <coughs> um, Aidan, in the UK, in the Labour Party, we're having kind of, well, we have this eternal drama of the youth section of the party and what role young Labour should play. Mm -hmm. So, how, I mean, you're here tonight with Fabian. How does the party's youth group work? How does GSLP youth section work? And how much kind of engagement do you have with the senior section of the party? Uh, thanks for the, for the question. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, essentially, the youth section is extremely involved uh, with the party. Uh, the youth section is one of the, the three constitutional sections of the party, the other being the women's section and then the senior citizens uh, section. Um, and the, the chairperson of the youth section actually gets a seat in the party's executive. So uh, what happens there is um, when we have our, our youth meetings, uh, we're able to uh, discuss essentially uh, things that, you know, we think are working, uh, policy decisions and et cetera. And then we can actually bring them, bring them to the executive and, uh, and you know, the, the elected members. So the government, current government ministers uh, will be present and other executive members. So the youth section plays an important role. And, and for that, you know, we have to thank the party because, um, you know, generally we have a, a very, very good, uh, good relationship with one another and they're able to help us out in, in whatever we need in um, promoting, you know, political education to organizing social events and raising money for charity. And they support us in everything that we do. So we have a very good relationship. And I think that, um, that key, uh, position in the executive committee um, does actually help a lot because we're able to share our views with them and communicate directly with them. Aside from that, the youth section uh, or many members of the youth section actually also have direct contact with either the elected members in parliament uh, as well as other executive members. So we have a very, very good relationship. Our size also helps, but the relationship is, is extremely positive and always have been because of Jesse P um, heavily invests in, in the youth. Brilliant. Maybe you've got something to teach young Labour in that case, because that sounds a lot <laughs> more cohesive. Um, to move on to kind of what's going on today, I remember a few years ago um, watching the Brexit results on TV, and this result came in, and it was 96% Remain, and I was like, yeah, we're going to win this. <laughs> Turns out it was Gibraltar. Um, and, you know, you voted to 96% Remain, and yet, we did leave the EU in January, even though, you know, that feels like an age ago. 
How do you think that Brexit is going to impact Gibraltar then in the future? Fabian, do you want to take this one first? Well, I mean, I, I thought that, uh, that Brexit was going to be the thing that was going to keep you most occupied in 2020, as you can imagine. Um, uh, and it hasn't been uh, to date, uh, but it is going to be extraordinarily difficult for Gibraltar. The, uh, the negotiations uh, will soon be restarting in earnest in relation to uh, Gibraltar's own aspects of uh, what Brexit will mean. Um, and of course, we are uh, the only part of the United Kingdom that has a direct land uh, frontier with the European Union. Remember that uh, Cyprus um, is, uh, is not on the continent um, and Northern Ireland is not on the continent. You know, we are the only part of the continent itself that is British, right? Uh, and then we've got a frontier which is notoriously difficult. The, the Spanish have used the Gibraltar frontier as a barometer of the relationship with Gibraltar uh, and have used it to try and uh, push Gibraltar in the direction of accepting the Spanish sovereignty over the rock and there's a pressure point, something which Gibraltar is never going to accept. So if you, if you look at most of what we have to achieve, it's to now ensure that we bring about the ability to move freely in and out of Spain for the 15,000 frontier workers who come in from Spain who are all nationalities as much for every resident of, of Gibraltar who wishes to travel out of Gibraltar for short or long periods, and every resident of the European Union uh, who may or may not live in this area, but who wants to come into Gibraltar uh, to shop or as a tourist, whether it's on a short holiday, if they're driving through Europe or otherwise. So we need to ensure that we preserve that. It's a mutual benefit for Gibraltar, Spain, and the rest of the EU, and indeed the UK. But it's a negotiation that uh, is going to be fraught with difficulty because Spain has not hidden. Uh, that it wants to have the sovereignty of Gibraltar for the past uh, 300 odd years. So why should anyone be persuaded that they might not try and use this moment to advance their position, whether they do so aggressively or not aggressively? And, and no Gibraltarian is ever going to think that uh, a Spanish government is not going to be pursuing that agenda. Although I'm very pleased to say that uh, we have a very strong relationship with the PSOE administration in Spain, a very positive one. Uh, but it's a, a, a relationship, obviously, of two separate governments with two separate agendas and two separate sets of interests. So Brexit is going to be difficult. Um, I have made no secret of the fact that I believe that Brexit is a bad idea. Uh, I have accepted it as the democratic will of the people of the United Kingdom. Uh, and the people of Gibraltar are a part of the plebiscite because David Cameron uh, agreed when he was prime minister at my request when the referendum was announced that Gibraltar should be included in that plebiscite because we vote or voted rather in European parliamentary elections for an MP in the European Parliament, so therefore we had to be entitled to vote on this uh, referendum. The challenges are therefore economic, they're social, um, and they're human, and they're coming thick and fast at Gibraltar as much as they are to the United Kingdom and indeed the European Union, which will also uh, face issues as a result of Brexit. And Aidan, as the kind of the young person here, how do you think your future is going to look kind of different now that Gibraltar has left the European Union with the rest of us? The, the, back back in, in 2016, when, when we campaigned, obviously, um, we, we knew that it was always better for us to, to remain within the European Union. And actually, many of our members formed part of the youth side of the Remain campaign, which was called Young Edge of Remain. Um, and we literally left no stone unturned and uh, we're very uh, thankful for the result that we actually, that we actually got. Um, obviously, our interests were, were better represented within the EU, but um, now that we've got to leave, I think, uh, look, uh, what's done is done and we have to try and look forward to the future. Um, it is true that it's going to be difficult. Uh, many negotiations are going to have to take place uh, and I don't en envy anybody that's going to partake in those negotiations. It's going to be Thanks. extremely difficult. <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be extremely difficult and i think um you know this was a witness that actually read the book uh, written by yanis varoufakis when greece actually voted to leave and he highlights in his book how difficult it was actually to negotiate with the, the european union uh it's no secret that they want to ensure that the united kingdom is is not successful um because obviously then what that can set as a president for other uh, nations to start leaving if they see that the UK is thriving. 
Um, but with this also comes different opportunities. And I'm very confident with how uh, a lot of young people are developing, especially in the age of technology, um, where uh, many young people uh, can innovate literally on the fly. And I think, you know, uh, this COVID-19 is demonstrating that, you know, with things like Zoom and just different ways to basically try and return to, to normality and keep businesses going and keep opportunities going at, at the same time. So you've mentioned it. Let's talk about the reason we're having to have this on Zoom tonight. Um, obviously, the UK is the worst hit country in Europe by COVID-19. Gibraltar and Gibraltar, you seem to have handled it really well. So, do you want to explain kind of how it has been, um, how you have dealt with it, how you have been hit? So, I think it's unfair for Gibraltar to pretend that it's done anything uh, better than anybody else, and we are conscious that our size is sometimes um, our greatest disability, but it's also our greatest advantage. And when it comes to having to make decisions about something as difficult as confining a population, then your small size is actually a great advantage. Um, and, and people in Gibraltar were becoming very conscious of what was happening with COVID. They didn't need persuading as uh, people um, elsewhere might have needed, for example, in Italy when it was coming from China, in Spain when it was coming from Italy, in the United Kingdom as it was coming. In Gibraltar, people saw what was happening in Spain and immediately realized that something had to be done. And therefore, the government's decision to act um, was one which was very welcomed by the people of Gibraltar and supported by the people of Gibraltar. So our success is thanks to the support of everyone in our community who really embraced the steps that we were taking and in particular the hard work done by Public Health Gibraltar and the Director of Public Health and the Gibraltar Health Authority, which is structured identically to the NHS. And then all of our frontline public sector workers from law enforcement uh, to our port service, et cetera, coming together to ensure that people could stay in their homes and have the support that they needed for this period. Now, you know that the weather in Gibraltar is slightly better than in the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. So, so people do want to get out and people have shown a tremendous amount of restraint in staying indoors and being very good in the way that they've gone to beaches, going to beaches for a short period when we were in the greater lockdown, going out for exercise, having a dip, then going back home, allowing others to go to the beach so social distancing could be observed. I would say that the one key difference in what we did was that we very early in the process actually confined by law into lockdown are over 70s. So uh, something that we, we were advised would be a measure that would give us uh, a great opportunity to protect them and to protect our GHA, our NHS equivalent. Because by protecting them, we also ensured that the virus did not catch in that particular and uh, exposed demographic. And in that way, we didn't have the pressure on our health services that we might otherwise have had. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, while talking about Brexit, the kind of the cross frontier workers that come from Spain. How, and Spain was the second worst country in Europe right at the start. So, how did you kind of work with Spain and the Pesari government to handle that and protect Gibraltar from that, in a sense? So, every measure that Spain took was designed uh, always to allow people to go to work. Um, and, uh, you know, therefore people who lived in this part of the world, um, whether they were living in Gibraltar or they were living in Spain, were at different times subject to different rules, but always with the caveat that they could go to work. Now, we closed down some of our industries. We closed down our retail industry, our tourist industry, etc. But we introduced a measure that paid every worker that was laid off in that period, was furloughed in that period, the minimum wage without deduction of PAYE or social insurance. And we worked with the unions on that and we worked with the Chamber of Commerce and the Federation of Small Businesses on that. And we managed to, to have consensus on that issue. Also with the opposition, I invited the leader of the opposition uh, to sit with us in cabinet when we made the key decisions. Uh, and we had a very positive period of engagement and consultation through the peak of the pandemic. Um, and I think that's made all the difference. And therefore, what you could see from Spain was that people 
uh, who were allowed to come into Gibraltar to the key jobs that they had to do at the time that those parts of our economy were still open, or you know, whether that was care services, health services, or um, supermarkets, pharmacies, etc., which remained open, or people who worked in offices in our financial services and gaming industry. Essentially, what we saw was that Spain uh, shut its borders, um, but ensured that its borders with Andorra and Gibraltar stayed open by creating an exclusion from that closure for cross-frontier workers, um, and therefore movement was, con was still allowed in both directions. There are very few people to work from Gibraltar to Spain, a handful, but also for other emergency reasons, like going for healthcare uh, purposes, etc. So um, I spoke to the Spanish Minister of the Interior about this, you know, uh, Fernando Malasca, and also to the Spanish uh, Foreign Minister on these issues and to the president of the Junta de Andalusia, who is the president of the regional government around us. And the relationship has been very fluid and very positive. Um, and where otherwise this might have been used in times past by the parties of the right in particular, but not exclusively, uh, as an excuse to hit at Gibraltar, um, that has not been the case happily on this occasion. That is really good to hear. Um, and I guess now for the future, Gibraltar, you've really been investing in your tourist industry, haven't you? And the nature of this pandemic means that travel really has been limited and we're about to hit kind of peak season. So how do you see Gibraltar being able to cope with this potential drop in tourism and how do you come back from that? So I, I think that this will be a very, very difficult year for our tourist uh, sector, for hotels, for those who are tour operators, uh, transport operators. Um, and it will be a difficult year also for our retail industry and our catering industry that is greatly exposed in different measures, uh, depending on what part of the retail catering industry you may be. Um, and therefore the government is going to have to support those industries. I think we will have a season because there will be a lot of national tourism in Spain. There may also be some international travel from the United Kingdom to Gibraltar once the quarantine periods are up, etc. And Gibraltar will be a safe British haven for people to come for two weeks in the sun, to enjoy our beaches and enjoy our bathing pavilions and enjoy our hospitality and catering. Uh, but I really don't think that normality, um, with all the good and bad that it brings, uh, will be restored in this year. And I imagine that that will likely happen during the course of 2021, or perhaps even 2022. I mean, we now have to also deal with people's fear of traveling abroad, people's concerns about the pandemic, the uh, effects on the tourism companies who are always also in competition with each other for uh, bums on seats. And now there's gonna be less seats, that means less bums, that means uh, less cash, competition is going to be harder, holidays are going to be more expensive. If, you know, snowbirds, coming from the north to the south, find it more expensive to come down, they have less disposable income when they arrive here, the challenges will be great. And we're on top of all of those and developing a strategy to try and help our tourist sectors to come back stronger than they were by demonstrating what it is that we offer, which is different to some of the coastal areas around us. I mean, Spain's a great place to go for a summer holiday, uh, but Gibraltar's even more fun. And uh, we speak English as our first language, um, and we know what you like, and, and uh, you enjoy yourself here a lot. Well, I, I, after researching for this, I've definitely started planning a holiday to Gibraltar eventually. Um, I just wanted to ask you as well. Um, sorry. Um, so you talked earlier, both of you, about your manifesto and just how much detail you put in, plans you have going forward. Obviously, coronavirus has kind of hindered slightly your ability to achieve everything you wanted to. But what are the key issues in society in Gibraltar still that you want to kind of work on to fix in your current term and government? So, so there are really three key areas that I could talk about there. One is, is governance, which is hugely important, um, but it, that's more for a thesis on government, and we can spend some time on that when you've got five hours for free. Um, the second, uh, which is in my view hugely important, is the, the uh, economy um, and how we turn the economy around, but in particular, how we are turning the economy to a green economy and how we've managed to show people that being uh, friendly to the environment, as people might have said in the past decade, 
and makes not just economic sense, but it's, it's required sense because there's a planetary emergency and we have to deal with that. So creating more parks, making Gibraltar greener, uh, trying to reduce pollution, going from a, from a diesel burning uh, power station to an LNG burning uh, power station that doesn't uh, create any uh, NOx emissions, etc. All of these things are hugely important. But if you put a political gun to my head, you said to me, what are the two things that you have done uh, that, uh, that are the most important, I would say, that there are two key human factors in what we've done in the past uh, eight and a half years, which would not have happened if we had not been in government. The first is that we introduced the right of individuals to have um, in vitro fertilization, um, and whether that is uh, heterosexual or uh, other types of uh, sexual orientations, the right to do that. Um, and when my political opponents used to say to me lazily, you know, um, oh, you say you represent the, a new dawn, you're just the same, etc. I would say to them, you know what? I met the first baby that came to be as a result of our policy of allowing in vitro fertilization. I met the new dawn. She's got a name, she's a Gibraltarian, and she's walking our streets today thanks to the changes that we brought about. And those children now are the children of married heterosexual couples, um, civil partnership couples of, of all sexual orientations, including heterosexuals, and the children of uh, couples who are not married and even of individuals. And that is really a magnificent thing that I'm very proud to have done. And of course, the other side of that is that we introduced, even before the UK, a law on civil partnerships, which was uh, there to permit all sexual orientations to enter into civil partnerships, including heterosexual civil partnerships, where, you know, from the, from the word go. One of the, the key criticisms that we might make of the UK civil partnerships law, we did it from the beginning. And then we brought about um, uh, an equal marriage law as well, which has allowed people to enter into the institution, the civil institution of marriage, uh, whatever their sexual orientations. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, the economy is about numbers on the page, it's hugely important, um, and it ensures that we can do what we want to do for our people and have the prosperity that we need to have. But at the core, the <coughs> politicians will be remembered for the human things that they achieved. Um, and I think those two are the, the key factors that it's likely we will be remembered for, for all the right reasons by all the right people. Amazing. And um, Aidan, when I was researching Gibraltar, one thing that really stood out was your education policy and the kind of student finance that you have. Do you want to explain a bit about how student finance works for people in Gibraltar yeah. and yeah. why that's pretty good? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> when I mentioned earlier, when, when the JSLP first came into power in, in 1988, um, one of the, the strongest um, reforms that they were lobbying for is a mandatory scholarship for anybody that got accepted into university uh, into the UK. Prior to that, um, the previous government had a point system. So depending on your grades, depending how many points you would actually get, and you had to get a minimum certain amount of points for the government to actually fund your studies. Meaning if you were accepted into a UK university, but you didn't meet that minimum point threshold, uh, the government wouldn't fund your studies. Um, when JSLP came in, they said, look, that had to stop, that we had to allow um, our youth, the young people, um, to go to, to university to study if they are accepted. Um, and the, the party on the other side said that they were, that, that would be throwing money down the barrel. And um, as, a, as a result of that, uh, I think rather than throwing it down, down the barrel, it's money very well spent. Uh, you know, now uh, it's extremely difficult uh, to find employment. You know, the market is extremely competitive. Um, so this uh, party and this government has always believed that, you know, they should equip uh, Gibraltarians with the best tools that they can. And, um, uh, you know, now they have a mandatory, initially with the first JSLP administration, there was mandatory scholarships for all students who would go to study uh, to university. So basically the students could actually go to the UK, they could study, they would uh, get their tuition fees paid for and an allowance as well and come back and you would have absolutely no debt. When this, uh, when the, the, during this uh, JSLP, when they came to power in 2011, this was also extended to postgraduate education. 
So now you could go, you could get a master's or you could do a PhD and you have to go and, and get, get permission, but the government would also fund that and you come back with no student debt whatsoever. You know, so we were able to go and I'm very fortunate because I'm part of the system and I'm a product of the system. I was able to go to university, finish my studies and I'm in the career that I'm in today, thanks to that, uh, that just of the administration. And I'm very grateful for that and, and for what I've done. But the, the salient point here, I think, to take away is that J the JSLP has provided an opportunity for everyone, regardless of where you come from uh, in relation to your family background, uh, regardless to your financial situation, everybody has the same opportunity. So you're not restricted because of your finances. You know, we hear a lot about certain people in the UK who can pursue their finance, who cannot actually go to university because, you know, maybe uh, financially they're quite poor off and stuff. And what you're doing there is depriving these individuals from an opportunity to, you know, excel in a, in a, in a career and better themselves. And that's what this, this uh, party and this government has done. It's given young people an opportunity to pursue their dreams. Yeah, I think and, uh, and in doing so has transformed Gibraltar because if you look at Gibraltar today, everybody who is in a post of authority or who is in a position of seniority in any of the key industries is likely to be a Gibraltarian or not a Gibraltarian because of a fair competition otherwise, but not because a Gibraltarian has not been able to aspire to that. Um, and I think that's a key difference between Gibraltar and some um, other territories. And we're very keen uh, to have a very engaged uh, population politically, very engaged population uh, professionally, because people have the education to understand key issues and to take decisions to put themselves forward for key posts and not rely on the importation of people for that. And that's really uh, the success that Joe Bosano has represented in terms of the revolutionary policy uh, that they said in 1988 was going to bankrupt Gibraltar um, and led to Gibraltar becoming more and more prosperous. A demonstration uh, that austerity never works and that investment is the best way forward. What you can achieve when you're a socialist in government, isn't it? <laughs> so thank you for such a brilliant discussion. We've got quite a few questions that have come in now, so bear with me while I scroll through them. First one we have is from Tom Williams. He says, where do you stand on the notion of British overseas territory sending MPs, whether with full voting rights or the right to vote only on matters of foreign policy and defence, to the House of Commons? Does this seem like a realistic prospect? So that's an issue which is a live issue. It's a proposal by a number of MPs here. And Gibraltar has so much autonomy that I wouldn't want to do anything that in any way endangers uh, that autonomy. Um, if we were offered a presence in the House of uh, Commons, uh, which didn't endanger our constitutional autonomy, um, that would be one thing. Um, but I, of course, understand that the Midlothian question is complex enough in respect of the devolved administrations that have much less power uh, for themselves than Gibraltar. So it would be extraordinarily complex to settle that issue. Uh, but in principle, of course, we would welcome that opportunity uh, within those uh, parameters. Uh, but it requires a lot of discussion um, in Gibraltar and in the overseas territories, and it has to be a realistic proposition before we start to turn our attention to it. And Aidan, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think exactly the same. I mean, um, that's one of the, the, the main issues. It's uh, quite ironic because Gibraltar under the UN uh, as Fabian stated earlier, is uh, classed as a non-self-governing territory. But when you look at sort of like, um, you know, the devolved uh, states of Scotland and Wales, Gibraltar actually has more devolved powers than, than they would, you know, because we're not uh, sort of, we don't actually come under Westminster, you know. So I think it's, it's easier for uh, our MPs to speak to, um, you know, higher up MPs, including um, you know, the leader of the opposition or the prime minister where we're at now than if we had a, a representative, which then, you know, everything would likely have to channel through them rather than us voicing our own, our own views. Cool. Thank you for that question, Tom. We now have a question from Mike Cockgreave, which I think we've already touched on, but if you wanted to add a few more 
on it. Um, how are relations with the Pessoa government in Spain and how do you view their policy agenda? So um, the relationship with the, with the Spanish government is, is better than it has been for uh, decades, I think. Um, you know, the relationship is a positive one. Um, and I hope that it will mean that in the medium to short to medium term, we'll be able to turn around the institutional relationship between Gibraltar um, and Spain. Um, it's not going to be easy, it is going to be difficult, but that doesn't mean that we will not uh, pursue uh, our ideological um, ability to understand each other uh, in a way that is going to help us um, at a government level as well. And their policy agenda in Spain to me seems actually um, exactly the right one for Spain at the moment. The partnership with Podemos, I think, um, is ensuring that it is a government more of the left than it might have been without that. Um, and therefore, I think that is going to be good for the left in Spain generally. We've seen the rise of the far right in the Spain as well, which is extraordinarily worrying, especially for those of us who are uh, so close to Spain and who have lived um, the fascist period. You know, we abut Spain, we have a frontier, we are that close. Um, and therefore, fascism in Spain has an effect on Gibraltar. And Vox is uh, an upcoming right-wing party in Spain, which is uh, fascist in everything but name. Although, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they probably started calling themselves phalangists uh, soon. That's all that's left. All right, thank you. Um, we've got now a question from Willoughby Matthews. Um, she says, looking at the results from the last Gibraltar general election, you've got 52.5% of the vote, yet in the most recent European elections, the Labour Party got 9.2% and has performed poorly in the past under a, a variety of leaders. Why is this? Well, that, uh, that question uh, would... Uh... Uh, Really, if I was able to answer that question succinctly, I think, um, I think I'd think i have a, um, a, an opportunity of spending a lot of time in the United Kingdom as a pundit. Uh, but I'll give you my, my Tuppany's worth. Um, and I think that people need uh, leadership that inspires them. And I think they need to identify with the leadership um, in, in that way. Um, and um, it's not a personal reflection or criticism that somebody uh, may be very good at some things, but not very good at others. Um, and I think that Labour now has an inspiring leader. Um, and I think that uh, the Labour leadership is an important part of Labour support. Um, and so I think that you know, it's good for the United Kingdom to have a strong opposition um, and, and a strong government. And uh, you know, I think uh, people are now looking forward to midday on Wednesday in a way that they haven't for a long time uh, because they know that they're going to see in the leader of the opposition the, the questioning that will represent the concerns of many um, and then they will get the answers from the government that may satisfy many uh, but that's what, what this political process is about and I think that's what's been missing in a serious and meaning, meaningful way um, and I'm very pleased that, uh, that uh, therefore that now is back because I think it's good for democracy. And I think that's recognized by people on all sides of the political spectrum. I've seen many right-wing commentators saying, you know, that uh, Keir Starmer's uh, approach is one of serious opposition that is to be reckoned with. Serious opposition that is to be reckoned with is potential electoral success when the time comes, depending on myriad factors but if you're not there at the starting line with a serious political opposition to be reckoned with, then you're not going to succeed. Thank you. And Aidan, what do you think? Do you think there's hope for Labour, finally? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think um, under Corbyn, um, one thing or another, then there was a lot of division in the party at, at some point. You know, I think uh, this past election, I think, was a, a bit of a disaster. But the one before, he actually didn't do too bad. You know, he managed to de derail the Conservatives where they had to actually form an alliance. I think that campaign, he was very strong. But I think there were a lot of internal issues within the Labour Party that um, he, he failed to deal with. And I think uh, going forward, you know, sometimes uh, you, you do back a party, um, but you bet on the jockey and not the horse. And I think this is uh, the current situation. You know, I think uh, 
uh, Keir Starmer recently has been uh, very impressive in Prime Minister's questions and constantly holding the government to uh, government on account, both in Parliament and then outside of Parliament as well, and then translating the, the message that he's trying to put across to uh, the average viewer. So I think that's a, a very, very effective tactic. Other than that, he articulates extremely me well and uh, basically you know having a, a career as a, as a barrister he knows how to put on a show and I think he's absolutely fantastic and I think he's uh, one of candidate that can possibly unite the, the current Labour Party. Brilliant. Um, so we've got a question now from Kashmir Hawker who wants to ask a question himself unfortunately I can't figure out how to do that on Zoom so I will just have to read it out I'm sorry Kashmir. Um, she says, or he says, sorry, um, good evening, Chief Minister, it's a pleasure to be here. In your eight years being Chief Minister, what would you say has been your best achievement in government? And also, I agree with the proposition of an MP for your lovely nation. Thank you very much, Catherine. I think I, I've answered that question already, um, mm. Holly. Um, it's the, the introduction of in vitro fertilisation on uh, the NHS, the GHA in Gibraltar, and the introduction of equal marriage um, having been preceded by civil partnerships for all including heterosexual couples. Uh, those key human issues, which I think are the ones that matter uh, the most. Yeah, I think you give a very good answer then as well. Um, so the next question is from Alexandru Mitchell, who asks, will have the Brexit, the first ministers of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales have loosely been consulted. Where does Gibraltar stand when discussing the future of the UK government? And I guess I would add to that. Um, you've obviously been Chief Minister through David Cameron, Theresa May, and now Boris Johnson being Prime Minister. And so would you find that any of them have been easier or more difficult to work with in terms of Brexit? Um, well, okay. Let me see. Um, the um, the the fact is that Gibraltar is fully involved in the Brexit negotiations involving Gibraltar. We're not just uh, consulted. Gibraltar's constitutional situation is such that uh, we believe we're entitled to that, and I can tell you that we have actually been fully consulted. Um, David Cameron didn't really run Brexit negotiations, uh, but he did. Uh, fully involved us in the process of the referendum. He became the first British Prime Minister to visit Gibraltar in the campaign um, since uh, um, I, I forget who in the 1960s or 70s. Um, and therefore he was very engaging when it came to Gibraltar and all issues relating to Gibraltar. Uh, Theresa May was true to her word to absolutely fully involve us in the negotiation and the withdrawal agreement negotiations were run by me for Gibraltar um, and we couldn't ask for more. My engagement with uh, Ollie Robbins was very, very full and the engagement of my officials with uh, Ollie Robbins and his negotiators was very, very full indeed. Um, and now under Boris Johnson, as we've moved into a, a task force Europe led by David Frost, our uh, involvement is equally uh, positive and engaged on every issue which relates to Gibraltar, and that means many of the issues, uh, not just the ones that flag up Gibraltar, but of course there are economic issues which don't tend to make the headlines. Gibraltar is fully involved in those discussions uh, when the, the negotiations are ongoing. The United Kingdom is negotiating for the whole of the British family of nations, um, and that includes Gibraltar. They make that point re repeatedly, even through Tim Barrow um, in the, uh, the embassy in, uh, in Brussels, um, and um, we can't really complain about that. Carwin Jones, when he was First Minister of Wales, came to Gibraltar and, and he said, you know, he appreciated just how much more um, administrative power had been devolved to Gibraltar under our constitution and had been devolved to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland under the devolution settlements. Um, and that is really telling, in particular, in the context of the Brexit negotiations, I would say. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to skip your question behind because I feel like that's already an been answered. Um, so we go on to Milad Amini, who says, I visited Gibraltar several years ago and it truly is a beautiful place. I hope to return in the future. I think a lot of us would share in that. 
Um, I wonder if you can please inform us of some of your social housing policies in Gibraltar and what provisions of affordable housing are provided to first time buyers. Um, so Aidan, can I start with you on this? As a young person, yeah. I guess, what do you feel your prospects are in Gibraltar of being able to own your own home? The, the, prospect, um, the prospects are, are quite high. When, when this government uh, came into, into power, one of the, the schemes that they wanted to, to do, they wanted to allow working class people to become, to become home, homeowners, essentially. And what the government has is this scheme, which is actually the, the house my parents bought, uh, the property that I hope to purchase in the future. And it's a, a government scheme, which is uh, it's called 50-50. Uh, and uh, essentially what it allows you to do is you can go, you can put your name down for a house and you buy essentially 50% of the property, whilst the government keeps the other 50%, allowing you to actually purchase your home. If in future, uh, you feel like you want to buy at, buy the other fifty percent. You can do so, but it allows you to it allows you to essentially become a become a homeowner. You know, with uh, quite quite easy. And uh, you know, this was first introduced by by this government in in the the late eighties, early nineties, and this government has has continued um, and they've already made uh, two two uh, two estates um, for for uh, a lot of young people purchasing houses, and there are. Uh, three more in the pipeline uh, currently uh, ready to go, which is um, phenomenal for, for people like me who can now actually, you know, uh, purchase these homes and become a homeowner because uh, unfortunately Gibraltar due, due to its size, you know, uh, the commercial uh, uh, housing is actually, you know, quite out of budget for many people. So, uh, so that affordable housing scheme does help a lot of young people and allows us to purchase our own homes. Yeah. And Fabian, do you have anything to add on that and I guess housing policy in general in Gibraltar? So that, that's exactly the right summary of, of the position in relation to affordable housing, 50-50 uh, housing as we call it, where the government cedes its 50% to a lending institution, um, and which can take 100% security, although um, the purchaser only purchases 50%. That's enabled a lot of young people in Gibraltar to purchase housing. We're building now about another 1,500 units, uh, which is a lot for Gibraltar. Um, and at the same time, there is the opportunity for the rental of housing from the government as well, uh, social housing as it would be known, uh, but very uh, high standard of social housing in Gibraltar. Um, so I think Gibraltar, for the size of the place, does extraordinarily well, although there's always going to be pressure in respect of housing for that reason, because of the size. Okay, Dominic McGinley has a quite an interesting question. Um, he asks, how close is the relationship between Gibraltar's political parties and the kind of vaguely analogous ones in Britain? So when Gibraltar was able to vote in the European Parliament elections, you were part of the southwest of England, I guess potentially because that was the geographically closest bit to you. Um, and so how kind of intent, how, what was the infinity like when people in Gibraltar were given a list of British political parties to vote for and their political party preference in Gibraltar? So if, if you look at uh, what it is that, that we have as a relationship with Labour, we are sister parties of the Labour Party. Um, none of the other parties in Gibraltar have that sort of affiliation uh, with their um, opposite numbers in the UK. There's been uh, close links between the GSD and the Tory party at different times in their history. Um, and the other one, the only other party that has a strong relationship is the Liberal Party, that is not just a sister party of the Liberal Party in the UK, but is also a part of the International uh, Liberal Forum and, and the International Liberal um, Group of uh, political parties. So the Socialists and the Liberals are very closely aligned to the UK and international organizations. We are uh, discussing with the Party of European Socialists uh, membership, and that has, of course, depended on the soil lifting its, uh, its uh, um, veto, which uh, for many years was there for other reasons, and that, that's why I hope that our new relationship will enable us to progress from that, and I'm optimistic that we will be able to. Um, so you know, whether it's in the UK or uh, around Europe or the world, the only ones with a strong uh, relationship um, are the Socialist Party and the Liberal Party. Okay, um, I'm aware that we're kind of, well, we've hit half an hour, so would it be alright with you two if I ask one more question that's come in, and then we wrap things up? 
So Owen Michael has asked something quite interesting. Um, how permanent do you consider your alliance with liberals given the electoral system? And how have you worked out this agreement in practice? Uh, so the, the alliance with the liberal party is working so well and that it uh, would make little sense to talk about um, undoing it at this stage. Um, and of course it is renewed at every election in the sense that we agree as executives to defend a joint manifesto. If there were a policy difference between us, that could lead to an end of the electoral alliance um, and therefore an end to uh, the coalition. Um, but at the moment, it seems unlikely that that might be the case. There are very strong interpersonal relationships between us as well. Um, so we tend to resolve any differences that may be between us through discussion, negotiation and, and dialogue. Uh, which is the, the right way to do it. And we've been able to ensure that no issue has got the better of our relationships. And I think if you, if you set out to do it that way, you will achieve it. Um, and you know, frankly, in a place like Gibraltar, it, it's, it's easy to fall out if you want to, uh, but it's also possible um, to ensure that you work together for the greater good and we're committed to doing that. Um, and we don't see a reason why we shouldn't continue to do that together from a socialist liberal perspective. And slightly related, um, Aidan, how much do you and the youth faction work with the equivalent kind of youth grouping in the Liberal Party? Do you tend to do events together or are you broadly separate? Um, normally we, we operate uh, separately. Uh, the main reason is because Obviously, we are united in government, but um, as a party, we're, we're two separate parties. Uh, we have done certain things with uh, certain liberal youth members in the past. Uh, they have helped us on, on certain projects, but generally we, we tend to organize stuff by ourselves. So the youth section basically has three pillars on which we operate, which is one, it's the political education, one, social events for young people, and uh, charitable events. Uh, and all those, we basically keep it with, uh, within the youth section. It's not to say that, um, for example, if we're approached to do something together, that we wouldn't do it. Um, but, you know, so far, basically, the Jessel PU section just operates by itself. Uh, and, you know, we have our input and as we're, we're both, because I think there can be a misconception because, uh, you know, both parties, they're not, uh, we're not a coalition, like, for example, the, the Tories and Labour, you know, we are an alliance because of the years that we've been together. And as Fabian mentioned, the interpersonal relationships um, that we have. Um, but generally, when it comes to sort of like the party structure, the JSLP youth section operates, uh, operates differently and, uh, and uh, yeah, without, the, without the Liberals. Cool. And one very, very last question from me. Um, Fabian, I saw that you've announced that this is going to be your last term in government. You're not going to stand again as leader of your party. So with the time that you've got left, what is kind of the one most pressing issue that you really want to try and get done before your stand comes to an end? Well, you ask any Gibraltarian political leader that, and he's got to give you one answer, decolonization. All right. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you both of you so much for joining us. Obviously, the pandemic has made this possible, but post-pandemic, I really hope that the Fabians and the GSLP can co collaborate more like this. Also, to everyone watching at home, we've got so many more events coming up if you have a look at our Facebook page or our Twitter or the website. So, thanks very much, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.